Welcome back. It's time to start looking at configuring the client access services. In this module, we're going to look at configuring the namespaces for each of the HTTPS services on the Exchange server. We're also going to look at configuring the SSL certificates, configuring the authentication settings for Outlook on the web, which is also sometimes known as OWA because the old name was Outlook Web App. We're going to look at configuring authentication settings for Outlook Anywhere. And we're also going to look at configuring the Kerberos authentication settings and why we configure Kerberos in our Exchange environments. So here are the HTTPS namespaces that have been planned for Globomantics. I've written out the full URLs of each of the services. You'll notice that they all use mail.globomantics.biz except for autodiscover, which we've planned to use autodiscover.globomantics.biz. The Outlook Anywhere URL is just the host name because Outlook Anywhere is just configured with the host name. It doesn't have a full URL with a HTTPS prefix or any virtual directory specified after it. But you can see that all the other ones are a mix of URLs with virtual directories. And in some cases, such as Exchange Web Services, there's a virtual directory and a particular file specified. To configure each of those namespaces, we're going to use some PowerShell commandlets. The set Outlook Anywhere commandlet is used to configure Outlook Anywhere. All of the other services are configured by using a set virtual directory commandlet. So for example, OWA is configured by using set OWA virtual directory. The exception to that is autodiscover. There is actually an autodiscover virtual directory and there is a set autodiscover virtual directory commandlet to go along with it. But the internal and external URLs that can be configured on that virtual directory are completely ignored by Exchange. Instead, we need to use the set client access service commandlet to configure the autodiscover service connection point or SCP. So let's go into the Globomantics environment and we'll take a look at configuring the namespaces for those HTTPS services. In order to make the configuration changes, we can log on to one of the Exchange servers and open the Exchange Management Shell. It is really best to make these configuration changes using PowerShell because the Exchange Admin Center doesn't provide you with the right controls to make all of the changes in the most efficient way possible. It would actually be quite tedious to go into the Exchange Admin Center and manually change each virtual directory settings. But we're going to start by looking at Outlook Anywhere. The Outlook Anywhere settings that we're interested in are the internal hostname and the external hostname. So currently those have defaulted to the server's fully qualified domain name and they need to be changed to mail globomantics.biz. The other settings we're interested in are the internal and external client authentication methods. The default settings there are NTLM for internal authentication and negotiate for external authentication. We're going to take a closer look at those settings a little bit later when we look at Kerberos authentication. So for now, we just need to change those external and internal host names to the correct values. Whenever you are configuring the internal and external host names with the set Outlook Anywhere commandlet, there are a few additional parameters required as well. I need to set the internal client authentication method, which is defaulting to NTLM. So we're going to keep that set to NTLM. I need to set the internal SSL requirement. Keep that as true. The external authentication method, which you'll recall was already set to negotiate. So we'll keep that at negotiate as well. And the external clients require SSL, which should also be set to true. So there's a few extra parameters that are required whenever you're setting those internal and external host names with set Outlook Anywhere. Now with four servers in the Globomantics environment that all need to be configured with the same namespaces, we just need to repeat that command for each of the additional server names. So that's Outlook Anywhere taken care of. Next, we can take a look at the virtual directories. 
So here's an example of one of the virtual directories. We're looking at the Outlook web app or Outlook on the web virtual directory by running the get our virtual directory commandlet. And we're just taking a look at the internal and external URLs. You can see that as with all the other services, they've defaulted to the fully qualified domain name of the server. Now we could go ahead and run the set our virtual directory commandlet and configure the internal and external URLs for the OWA virtual directory. Of course, we'd need to repeat that task for all of the other virtual directories on the server. Each of the services has their own commandlet for configuring the internal and external URLs. And then we need to repeat that again for each of the servers in the environment. So there's a lot of work there typing out those commands individually and trying to configure all of the servers with the same settings. It's likely that a typo could be made or a mistake or some inconsistency could creep in that will cause problems later. So the best way to do this is actually to write a script. And here is the script that Dave has come up with for his Globomantics server configuration. This script is going to take just a few parameters, the server name or multiple server names in this case, the internal URL and the external URL. Now you can set those URLs independently if the design calls for it, but in Globomantics, they're going to be the same anyway. This script is going to loop through each of the server names that are provided and then run the appropriate PowerShell commandlets to set the internal URL and the external URL for each of the services. So you can see that there is a commandlet included in the script for OWA, the Exchange Control Panel, ActiveSync, Exchange Web Services, the Offline Address Book, and the Mappy Virtual Directory. Let's save that script somewhere where it's easy to find. And go back to the Exchange Management Shell. We'll run the script for all of the servers at once. So just providing a comma separated list of names. The internal URL is mail.globomantics.biz and the external URL is also mail.globomantics.biz. Now that's all we need to provide is the mail.globomantics.biz portion of the commands because as you can see, that's going to be used as a variable in the script and the script is going to put the HTTPS on the front of it and the correct virtual directory name on the end of it so we get the full URL for each service. Now one thing you might notice when you're running this script is that if the internal URL or the external URL that you specify is not already in DNS that you'll get this prompt that it can't be resolved and the script just wants to make sure that you do want to continue. In this case we do. Well, our script has finished running and all of those HTTPS services have had their namespaces configured, the internal URLs and the external URLs. What we haven't done is configure the auto-discover service connection point. So let's take a look at that next. By running the get client access service commandlet, we can see each of the server names and then the auto-discover service internal URI. So that auto-discover service internal URI is the auto-discover namespace or the service connection point that is registered in Active Directory for each of these servers. For the Globomantics namespace design, we want to configure all of these to the same value, which is going to be autodiscover.globomantics.biz. So to configure all of them to the same value, let's pipe the output of get client access service into the set client access service commandlet and we're going to use the auto discover service internal URI parameter to set the new URL which is https colon slash slash autodiscover.globomantics.biz and then you append slash autodiscover and slash autodiscover.xml So taking another look at the output of get client access service, we can see that all of those auto discover internal URIs have now changed to the namespace auto discover .globomantics Configuring those auto discover service connection points is actually a little bit quicker and easier 
than configuring all of the other HTTPS services. Before our clients will be able to connect to that new namespace configured on all the Exchange servers, we'll need to add records to DNS so that they can actually resolve that namespace to an IP address. So the two records that we need to put into DNS are mail.globomantics.biz. And for now, without any load balancing in place, we're just going to point it at one of the Exchange servers, San Francisco Exchange Server 1. And we'll also do the same for the auto discover record in DNS, pointing that to just that single Exchange server for now. Now, just something to be aware of when you're changing namespaces in your Exchange environments. The auto discover service does cache some information. So when you make changes to your namespaces, it's not always the case that they will immediately take effect for your end users. What you can do to speed up the process of that cached information expiring is to go into the IIS manager on your Exchange servers and recycle the MS Exchange Auto Discover app pool in IIS. And that will flush out any cached values and you should see the changes that you made take effect much faster. If there's multiple servers in your environment, well, of course, you'll need to repeat that process on each of those servers. So now that the namespaces are configured and the DNS records are in, let's have a look at what's changed in the user experience. So we're logged onto the client computer. We'll just launch Outlook. We can see that we still get security alerts popping up, but this time we're trying to connect to mail.globomantics.biz. Now the same issues as before still exist. The SSL certificate is not trusted yet, which is a problem we're going to solve in the next video. But it's good to be able to see that mail.globomantics.biz and autodiscover.globomantics.biz is what the client is trying to connect to. And then we can see there's still a few stray connections going to the server fully qualified domain names. That's not a problem. We can expect all that to clear up once we get the SSL certificates in place. So let's move on with configuring SSL certificates for Exchange. And we'll look at the SSL certificate steps that need to be followed. The first step is to generate a certificate signing request, which is also just called a CSR. Once you have that CSR, you can submit it to a certificate authority and they will issue the certificate to you. Download that certificate issued by the CA to your server and then install the certificate on the same server that generated the CSR in the first place. After you've installed it on that first server, you can export it from that server and import the certificate to other servers. So you can in fact use the same certificate across multiple servers, and in fact it is definitely recommended to do so. Now here's a tip if you are trying to do this in your own training lab. You can get free SSL certificates from the likes of startssl.com and komodo.com. I won't make any particular recommendation if you are considering free SSL certificates for a real production environment. Just remember you do get what you paid for when it comes to SSL certificates. You might find that free SSL certificates aren't compatible with all devices or with all of the applications that are being used by your users and within your environment. But for training purposes, you can try out a free SSL certificate since it literally costs you nothing to give it a go. You can only acquire certificates from public certificate authorities for domains that you actually own. You need to prove that you own the domain before they'll give you that certificate. If you don't own the domain, or if you can't prove you don't own the domain, for example, if you're using a non-routable namespace like domain.local, well, they're not going to give you that certificate. But on the upside, an SSL certificate from a public certificate authority is not actually required if you're just considering this for training purposes. You can install certificate services on your test lab domain controller and you can just issue certificates from there. It will cost you absolutely nothing. The only caveat, of course, is that those internally issued certificates will not be trusted by any non-domain joined computers or devices. So if you're doing any testing from outside your network or with external testing tools that are using SSL, you can expect that they'll run into certificate trust issues. 
Let's go into the Globomantics environment and configure that SSL certificate that we need for all of the Exchange servers. First, we're going to need that certificate service requests, and the best place to generate the CSR is actually in the Exchange Admin Center. After logging on to the Exchange Admin Center, just go to the Service section and then click on Certificates. We need to create a new Exchange certificate. You have a choice to create a request for a certificate from a certification authority or to create a self-signed certificate. We don't want a self-signed certificate in this case. We definitely do want one from a certification authority. Give the certificate a friendly name. I'm just going to call it Exchange Certificate. You have the option to generate a request for a wildcard certificate. Wildcard certificates can be a little simpler to manage because you don't have to plan all of the different names as long as they're all within the same root domain. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to request a SAN certificate or a certificate with multiple names on it. The certificate request needs to be stored on one of the exchange servers. I'm going to choose San Francisco Exchange Server 1. And now we need to specify the domains that are included in the certificate. Now this list here is actually a little bit cumbersome to work with. It's easier just to skip to the next screen and then you can manually adjust the list of names that has come out. So we need to remove the server short name and also remove the root domain from the list so that all we're left with is mail.globomantics.biz and autodiscover.globomantics.biz, which are the two names that we've planned to be the namespaces of this Globomantics environment. Each certificate needs to have some organization information provided to the certificate authority. That information should match or closely match the who is information on your domain name registration. So the information you put in here should be true and accurate. Next, we need to choose a place to store the certificate request that's being generated by the server. The path that you put in here needs to be a UNC path. And the easiest thing to do is just use the C drive on one of your exchange servers. So I'm going to store it on the San Francisco Exchange Server 1 in the C admin folder. And the file is going to be certificate.req. So now we have our exchange certificate. It is now in a status of pending request, and it will stay that way until we go and submit that certificate signing request to the certificate authority who's going to issue the certificate to us. Let's have a look at that request file. You can open that with a text editor such as Notepad. And this is what a typical certificate request will look like. So this is the data that you need to copy and paste into the form that your certificate authority provides you when you're purchasing a certificate. So choose any provider, whether it's a free one or a commercial one that you'll pay for a certificate from, step through their purchase process, and when they ask you for your certificate signing request information, you'll copy and paste the contents of this file into their form and then continue through their process. The certificate has been acquired from the certificate authority and downloaded to the exchange server. The easiest thing to do at this point is just to take a note of the file name. Let's go back to the Exchange Admin Center and we can now complete this pending certificate request. What we need to do is provide the UNC path to the file. And now that certificate is installed and valid. But at the moment, it's not enabled for use with any of the HTTPS services on this server. We need to actually enable it by editing the certificate, selecting services, and we want to use this one for IAS, SMTP, IMAP, and POP. Now it's only the IAS option that is really relevant for this particular module of the course, but in the real world, you'll likely be enabling your certificate for multiple services, which is why I'm demonstrating it that way at this stage.
When you see this question about overriding the existing default SMTP certificate, you can say yes if that's the certificate you plan to use for all your SMTP namespaces as well. Well, now we can test that SSL certificate by going back to our client machine and trying to connect with Outlook. Now, if everything is configured correctly, we should expect to see Outlook start on this client without any certificate warnings or other unexpected behavior at all. Well, that all looks good and we can even check the connection status to confirm that yes, we're connecting to mail.globomantics.biz as the namespace for Exchange. Well, that SSL certificate is installed on the first Exchange server. We now need to put the same SSL certificate on each of the other Exchange servers in Globomantics as well. And to achieve that, we can export the Exchange certificate from San Francisco Exchange Server 1. The file needs to be exported to a UNC path. And I'll just recommend that you copy that path to your clipboard because you're going to need it again in a few seconds. You also need to specify a password to use to protect the file. And then it's as simple as clicking OK. And then go ahead and import the exchange certificate. So just provide the same UNC path as before and the same password. Specify the servers you want to apply the certificate to. So just choose the other three servers or the other servers in the environment that need the same certificate. And after that import, has been successfully completed, it's simply a matter of going to the other exchange servers and enabling that certificate for the same services as we did for SF Exchange 01. So just go ahead and repeat that process for all of the servers in the environment. And now they're all configured with the same SSL certificate configured for the same services. And that aligns with the best practices for Exchange 2016 and certificates when it comes to client access. Now, Outlook is not the only way that users will connect to their mailboxes. They'll also frequently use Outlook on the web or webmail to access their mailboxes. So let's have a look at the authentication settings for Outlook on the web. There are a few options to choose from. The first is basic authentication, which to the user basically means that a username and password dialog box will pop up for them to enter their credentials. Those credentials are transmitted in clear text. So that connection to Outlook on the web should be secured by HTTPS. But basic authentication is not very user friendly at all. And it's not very commonly used for Outlook on the web access these days. There is also integrated Windows authentication. When you have integrated Windows Auth enabled, the user's Windows logon information is automatically used to log them in to Outlook on the web, which means they won't be prompted for a username and password. But that's only if the Outlook on the web URL is in the intranet or trusted sites zone in Internet Explorer, where that automatic logon is permitted. With integrated Windows authentication, the hashed credentials are transmitted across the network, and that is also secured by HTTPS. And if that automatic logon doesn't work for some reason, the user will see a pop-up prompting them to enter their credentials, very similar to the basic authentication user experience, but instead it's using NTLM or Kerberos under the hood. Then we have forms-based authentication. Now, forms based authentication presents a nice user-friendly login form. The credentials are transmitted in clear text because the user is just filling out a form in their web browser. So again, that is secured by HTTPS. There are multiple login formats that can be used when you have forms based authentication enabled. There is the familiar domain slash username format. There's also the user principal name or UPN. But when you enable this option, it's actually presented as email address on the login form. So this is an argument for matching the UPN to the user's primary email address. And that way, when they're logging on to Outlook on the web, all they really need to think about is what's my email address and what's my password. 
which can be a little easier to remember than the domain slash username format. You can also just use the username only and you can predefine the default login domain. So all I need to enter is the username itself. Closely related to Outlook on the web is the Exchange Control Panel. ECP serves up the options user interface for Outlook on the web users. So when they want to modify mailbox options or Outlook on the web options, they're actually accessing the Exchange Control Panel. It's also what serves the Exchange Admin Center for administrators when they're connecting and doing the web-based administration of Exchange 2016. You should configure your Exchange Control Panel's authentication configuration to match the Outlook on the web settings. When you have a multi-server environment as Globomantics does, it's important that you deploy the same authentication configuration across all of the servers that share the same namespace. If you don't do that, you'll find that your Outlook on the web users will have an authentication experience that varies depending on the server that the user first connects to. So in some cases, they may be prompted for their email address, but then if they are load balanced to a different server on the next session, they might be prompted for their username or their domain name slash username. So that's not a very good experience. There's also the possibility that sessions that are interrupted where a connection switches to a different server will log them out and force them to log back in. So let's go back into the Globomantics environment and we'll take a look at how to configure authentication settings for Outlook on the web. Now, keep in mind that we've configured namespaces now for our servers. So Globomantics is now using mail.globomantics.biz as the namespace for Exchange. And the SSL certificate has been installed on the Exchange servers. And at the moment, DNS is just pointing to San Francisco Exchange Server 1. Now, what all that means is that we can actually start connecting to the Exchange control panel or the Exchange Admin Center using the mail.globomantics.biz namespace and just use the forward slash ECP to access the Exchange Admin Center. The Outlook on the web authentication settings are found in the servers section under virtual directories. And you can actually filter the list of virtual directories to show just the Outlook on the web or OA virtual directories. San Francisco Exchange Server 1 is the one that we're going to configure first. So we'll just edit that virtual directory. And in the authentication settings, we see all of the available options for forms-based authentication. So by default, the domain slash username format is used, and we would actually like to change that to the user principal name. But we need to make this change across all of the servers in the environment, not just San Francisco Exchange Server 1. So the best way to actually do that would be in the Exchange Management Shell. First, let's take a look at the OA virtual directory settings across all of the servers. And when running the get OA virtual directory commandlet, if you just add the dash 80 properties only parameter, that will just speed things up a little bit because it only retrieves the attributes from Active Directory instead of making an RPC call to each of the Exchange servers themselves. So in that output, we can see for all four servers, the logon format is using that default full domain format and also that forms-based authentication or FBA is enabled for both internal and external authentication. So what we want to do is change that logon format to use the user principal name so that end users can log on with their email address and password, assuming that their user principal name matches their primary SMTP address. To do that, we can pipe the output of get our virtual directory into the set our virtual directory commandlet and we want to change the logon format to principal name. So all of those servers have been updated and you'll see there's a warning for each server saying that IIS needs to be restarted in order for that change to take effect. Just before we do that, let's take a look back in the Exchange Admin Center because if you recall, the Exchange Control Panel authentication settings should be configured to match the Outlook on the web authentication settings. So we can switch to the ECP virtual directories and then we'll just take a look at the configuration for San Francisco Exchange Server 1. Check the authentication. 
And you can see that by default, it's already configured to use forms-based authentication and the ECP Virtual Directory will simply use the same sign-in format that you configure for Outlook Web App. So the only thing to do now is to reset IIS on each of the Exchange servers. I'm going to do it on San Francisco Exchange Server 1. And it would then be necessary to repeat that on each of the other Exchange servers as well. So if using the user principal name means that we should match our user principal names to primary SMTP addresses, we need to make sure that the user accounts are actually configured that way. So I'll just go into Active Directory Users and Computers. And here is the user that has been logging on so far in all of the tests. And he's got an email address of adamwally at globomantics.biz. But in his account settings, there is currently no user principal name set. So we'd simply need to select the globomantics.biz UPN suffix and then add the user login name as well. To test that change, we can use a web browser and just connect to the Outlook on the web URL, which is https mail.globomantics.biz forward slash OWA. So at the moment, DNS only points that namespace at one exchange server because we haven't looked at load balancing yet, but it will still work for this demonstration. And we're still interested to see that Outlook on the web app connects, that there's no certificate warnings or certificate errors, and that we're able to log in with that correct login format. So as you can see, when you choose user principal name, the login form presents that as an email address field. And that gives the user a nice, friendly, easy to remember way of logging into their webmail. Next, let's take a quick look at configuring the authentication settings for Outlook Anywhere. Now this is more of a learning tip or an exam tip for you rather than something you'll necessarily need to do a lot in the real world. The default Outlook Anywhere authentication settings are negotiate for external authentication and negotiate will fail back to NTLM if it's unable to successfully negotiate or successfully use Kerberos authentication. And then NTLM is used by default for the internal client authentication method. The IIS authentication, so the IIS virtual directory that Outlook Anywhere uses is enabled for basic NTLM and negotiate, which means that IIS is ready to accept either of those authentication types. Now in an Exchange 2016 organization, MAPI over HTTP is enabled by default and any supported clients that can use MAPI over HTTP will use that instead of Outlook Anywhere. So you'll often find that Outlook Anywhere is not used anyway in your Exchange 2016 organizations unless you've deliberately disabled MAPI over HTTP or someone is connecting with a client that does not support MAPI over HTTP and fails back to Outlook Anywhere instead. But the key thing to remember, especially as you're preparing for your exam, is internal versus external authentication and how that will behave. So we already know that Negotiate will attempt Kerberos first and then fall back to the NTLM challenge response if Kerberos does not work. But if you have internal and external host names configured for Outlook Anywhere to be the same host name, only the internal authentication method is used because in effect, the client cannot tell the difference between whether it's connecting internally or externally. So it just assumes that the internal one is the one that should be used. If you have a requirement to use separate authentication methods, so for example, if you have a requirement to use basic authentication for external connections only, perhaps to support a load balancer or a reverse proxy that is doing pre-authentication of those connections, then you'll need to use separate namespaces. For example, you might use mail-external.globomantics.biz as the external namespace for Outlook Anywhere, and then mail.globomantics.biz for the internal namespace for Outlook Anywhere. Now keep in mind that users don't need to know those namespaces. They don't type those namespaces into their Outlook application or manually configure Outlook. This is all handled by AutoDiscover and their Outlook client will automatically configure with either those internal or external namespaces. 
So really you can use any namespace you like, even if it's one that's slightly inconvenient for a person to remember and type in because they simply don't need to remember or type in that namespace. But the most important thing is that whatever namespaces you use for Outlook Anywhere, internally and externally, both of those namespaces must be included on the SSL certificate so that the client doesn't get any SSL certificate warnings in Outlook when they're connecting. In this video, we're going to talk about Kerberos authentication. And this is not something that you have to do in an Exchange 2016 deployment, but it is something that is recommended, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand why. To begin with, let's take a look at how the NTLM authentication process works. The client connects to the client access namespace and sends the logon request to the Exchange server. The Exchange server replies with an authentication challenge to which the client responds. Now the Exchange server sends the challenge and the response to a domain controller, and the domain controller authenticates the client and tells the server the result. The Exchange server notifies the client that access has been granted or that access has been denied. The concerns with this process are that the connection used by the Exchange server to authenticate clients will go to a single domain controller only. As more clients connect, the same authentication process needs to be repeated for each of them. And if multiple exchange servers are deployed, there's no load balancing mechanism to ensure that authentication traffic is evenly distributed across all available domain controllers. Every exchange server could potentially hit the same domain controller, eventually exceeding the maximum concurrent connections and creating a bottleneck in authentication requests. The Kerberos authentication process works a little differently. First, the client connects to the KDC or the Key Distribution Center to acquire a ticket granting ticket. Now, so far, the client hasn't been authenticated for any services. Now, let's say the client wants to connect to the client access namespace, so it requests a service ticket for the target server, in this case, mail.globomantics.biz. The ticket granting service issues the service ticket, which is encrypted so that only the target server can decrypt it. The client presents the ticket to the Exchange server to request access. However, the ticket is for a service mail.globomantics.biz, and the server is, for example, sfexchange01.globomantics.biz, so the server is unable to decrypt the service ticket. Kerberos authentication will fail, and the client will retry with NTLM instead. The solution for this problem comes in two parts. The first is registering service principal names for the client access namespaces. However, the same SPN can't be registered for more than one Active Directory computer account. So when the client access namespace is load balanced across two or more servers, Kerberos would still fail. The solution to that issue is to register the SPNs to a separate computer account known as the Alternate Service Account, or ASA. Each of the Exchange servers is then configured with a shared credential for the ASA computer account. When the client presents a service ticket to the Exchange server to request access, the Exchange server is able to use the shared credential to decrypt the service ticket, and the Kerberos authentication process is able to complete successfully to either grant or deny the access request from the client. Overall, the Kerberos authentication process is faster, and it doesn't have the same bottlenecking issues as NTLM, so that's why it's recommended for deployment with Exchange 2016. All right, let's go into the Globomantics environment and we'll take a look at how to configure Kerberos authentication. To start with, we need to create the computer account in Active Directory that's going to be used as the alternate service account. The name of the computer account is not all that important, as long as it's something that you'll recognize, and you should consider placing it in an OU that is secured with some permissions or delegation on those OUs to prevent low-level administrators in your environment from accidentally deleting that account. Next, we're going to use PowerShell, and we're going to run the following command. What does that command do? Well, it adds support 
for AES encryption for that computer account. That's not something you're likely to get tested on in the certification exam, but in the real world, that's certainly something you would want to look at enabling. Well, now that that computer account has been created, we can go to the Exchange Management Shell for the next steps. There is a script provided with the Exchange Scripts folder. It's called Role Alternate Service Account Password. So we need to run that script. And we're going to roll the ASA password to one of the servers in the organization to begin with. And what we're doing here is telling it to generate a new password for that computer account that is being used for the ASA. And we can see that this script was successful in the end. Now let's take a look at the alternate service account credential for SF Exchange 01, which is the first server that was configured. And we can see it's been updated with that Exchange 2016 ASA computer account. The previous value was that it had no alternate service account configuration applied. So having applied that configuration to one of the Exchange servers, we can now copy that configuration to the remaining Exchange servers in the environment. So this time the script is going to copy the ASA configuration from SF Exchange 01 to the other servers, SF Exchange 02, New York Exchange 01, and New York Exchange 02. And the script was successful again. Next, we need to add the service principal names to that computer account. The service principal names that are required are the client access namespaces. And we use the set SPN tool to add those client access namespaces as service principal names. So in this case, it's mail.globomantics.biz. And we're adding it to the computer account in the Globo domain called Exchange 2016 ASA. And just need to repeat that command for the auto discover namespace as well. As one final step, we can actually configure Outlook Anywhere on all of the Exchange servers to use Kerberos authentication or rather to negotiate authentication for the internal client authentication method. So now Outlook Anywhere is configured for Kerberos authentication or rather it's configured to be capable of Kerberos authentication for internal domain joined clients. So that brings us to the end of this module. Let's take a look at what was covered. We looked at how to configure the namespaces for the HTTPS services on our Exchange servers, and also how to configure the SSL certificates. The authentication settings for Outlook on the web were also configured, as well as taking a look at how to configure Outlook anywhere for different authentication. Finally, we went through the reasons and the steps for configuring Kerberos authentication with Exchange. Let's move on to the next module now, which will cover load balancing for Exchange 2016 client access.